First of all, a very warm welcome to all of you. Um, I'm, I'm sure Delhi has warmed you up sufficiently, but nevertheless, uh, we will add to the warmth of that uh, <clears throat> by welcoming you here. Um, we are here to uh, celebrate uh, a, a, a distinguished leader and a distinguished organization which really started off the, the behavioral movement, which is uh, the BIT and uh, David Halpern who, who leads it. And we are also uh, very pleased to be joined by our Honorable Vice Chancellor in welcoming all of you to this event, uh, Professor Soma Rai Chaudhary. And there is a bit of a Cambridge-Oxford uh, thing happening here. We will discover that in, in conversations as we go forward. So not only do we want to celebrate uh, BIT today, uh, we also want to discuss a very important topic, and that is the, uh, the, the role of behavior science in, in public policy. Um, but before I introduce our uh, chief guest, Professor Rai Chaudhary, I thought I should uh, thank our founders, one of whom is sitting here, uh, Archana Vyas, and uh, Ashish Dhawan and Pramod Sinha. These, have, these people have been the pillars of our organization. And uh, we should have some benefact uh, some people from Gates here as well. I was expecting Suhail and a few others. All of you feel a very warm welcome. And, uh, and to Bias, our partners, uh, Shubo, I, I think I saw, there he is. Very good. Um, we have an incredible panel, uh, mostly comprised of uh, my dear friends, and so there's a bit of nepotism happening here, but I can assure you they're brilliant nevertheless. I mean, you know, RR, uh, Neerat, Sujoy, Rory, of course, and Urvashi, who represents JPAL, and JPAL is a bit of a household thing for me because my partner is from JPAL, and I can't criticize JPAL at home. And then, of course, Shagato Mukherjee, who's, a, who's my dear colleague and a brilliant economist. Uh, so we have a, an excellent panel for the discussion part. But I thought, uh, you know, <clears throat> uh, to just sort of, before I introduce uh, Professor Rai Chaudhary, who's an extraordinarily eminent astrophysicist, uh, I, you know, I, I, I thought uh, I'd set the context, uh, the context around the intersection between behavior science and public policy. Logically, and uh, by necessity, this space is constituted of two types of thinking. Yesterday I was mentioning this to David. <clears throat> there is the scientific part, and we have an embedded team, a scientific team which sits in the government, and they think in a particular way. And then there's the administrative part, and they think in a particular way. And they have two different methodologies. The scientific, of course, seeks to falsify hypotheses. This is the classical Popperian tradition, whereas the administrative seeks to corroborate viewpoints, right? Because they need to reduce the costs of uh, uh, coordination. They need to reduce the cost, transaction costs of coordination. That's the fundamental aim of the administrative part. So now these two come together. And uh, it's, a, it's oftentimes a contentious relationship, and sometimes it, they converge together very beautifully. And it's been a great learning experience for us. And to illustrate this in an idiom that uh, our chief guest and Archana, both physicists, might uh, relate to better, I would like to take the example of Galileo hmm, from the history of ideas. Galileo developed and improved the telescope, and he started to observe the four moons of Jupiter from which he drew an inference that the moons actually circle around Jupiter. And in doing so, he challenged uh, the ecclesiastical authority. He, 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 he basically said that there's a planet or there's an object in the universe other than the Earth which is orbited by other objects. And that came as a bit of a shock to the, 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 the Medici family, which at that time was the administrative unit. So you have a scientist here who's using an instrument and coming up with evidence, and you have an administrative unit, which is the Medici family, which is backed by ecclesiastical authority, and that's where the tension began, right? So it, 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 in some sense, it brings to the fore the challenges of presenting scientific evidence to power, 
and that's not always easy. And power has its own internal logic. It has its own internal pragmatic logic. They need answers very quickly, whereas scientists seek to, you know, uh, take their own ponderous space and come up with results. So how do you sort of align them in, in, on, the, on the time scale is often a challenge. Um, then there is also another interesting lesson to be drawn from Galileo's example, and Professor Raichaudhuri will, uh, will appreciate this point. Astronomy is not an experimental science. You can't control conditions in the universe. It's an observational science. So there's a sort of a plurality of methods. And sometimes behavior science strays towards the experimental side a little too much. And so that's another uh, interesting side note that I'd like you to uh, take with you. So in, in terms of uh, our first speaker, Professor Rai Chaudhry, he's, as I mentioned earlier, he's an eminent scholar. Uh, he's the Vice Chancellor of Ashoka University. He graduated from Presidency College. I see a lot of Presidency College people here. They're taking over this world, <clears throat> Calcutta, and the University of Oxford. Uh, after his PhD from Cambridge, he worked at Harvard and was a part of the team uh, that built the Chandra X-ray observ ob Observatory for NASA. After teaching more than a decade at the University of Birmingham in the UK, he returned to India as the Dean of Science at Presidency University, Kolkata and later as the director of the Inter-University Center for Astronomy and Astrophysics, IUCAA. Dr. Rai Chaudhary is a fellow of the National Academy of Science. His research involves topics in cosmology and astrophysics from ground and space. And uh, I, I'm, I may also add another uh, little nugget here uh, to add to his introduction, which normally doesn't get mentioned in his Wikipedia. And I, dug through his background. He has a single author publication in Nature at the age of 25, 25, 26, which is an extraordinary feat. So I mean, that tells you about uh, the quality of an academic that he is. Um, it's a, such an honor for you, for, for, for us, uh, Professor Rai Chaudhary, to have you here with us. And uh, I would like you to make a few comments and then uh, introduce Ashoka University. And then we can, I'll introduce our guest of honor. Thanks, Pavan. I mean, after such an introduction, I'm not sure I can make, um, uh, you know, uh, it's all be a, a, an anticlimax. So um, I, uh, I thank you. I'm very, very honored to be here. And of course, uh, meeting David uh, for the first time, having heard such a lot about um, the Behavioral Insights uh, team and the work that's done worldwide. It's ab absolutely amazing for me to be here. I. Um, and, and also, I, I, I really enjoyed the way Pavan made the connection between astrophysics for me and, 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 and what we're going to talk about today. Um, I'll talk about that in a minute, but let me just also tell you that I'm here as the Vice Chancellor of Ashoka University, which is the uh, institution with which this Center uh, for Social and Behavioral Change is, is associated. Um, for benefit of the people who don't know Ashoka, just um, a few words. To, to set the, the background and why um, the two institutions are, uh, are so well connected. Um, Ashoka is, is an experiment, quote unquote, that is quite unusual, even in the Indian context. Um, in India, most universities, uh, there are more than a thousand universities in India right now. Um, the origins of most universities lay in either federal or state funding and um, uh, private universities in India started mostly as um, places where technical education or business schools, engineering schools and medical schools were placed, law schools. In the recent decade or so, um, there has been a move to bring liberal arts education and the core humanities and sciences into the private sector. And even there, the universities that have come into being have been, have, do, do belong to single business houses or families and often um, work in a profit-making uh, environment. Side by side, there's another aspect to Indian uh, education, higher education, and that is, for whatever reason, 75 years ago after independence, India decided to make universities just an extension of high school. 
which means only teaching happened in universities and very little research happened. And the research institutes were created separately for people doing research, both in the sciences and in the humanities, as places where students, undergraduate students particularly, had no access to. Which then meant that um, generations of um, undergraduates, including us, our generation, did not see research happening in the country. And then we went abroad. And then this move has now started of integrating research into a natural university environment, like it happens all over the world, which I think is a very welcome change. And so Ashoka comes into this picture, starting off as a liberal arts and sciences place, where the idea was to start off with a very interdisciplinary um, uh, undergraduate institution, which then brings in research and graduate work in the field of the core arts and sciences. So we don't have any um, professional schools right now, engineering, medical, etc. We have the core disciplines um, with a strong undergraduate presence, about 3,000 students or so, and then building on it, on it is the research environment that is growing now. Our first PhD graduated last month. Uh, and it's, the university is, believe it or not, less than 10 years old. And we have alumni um, in all the distinguished institutions all over the world. We have three Rhodes Scholars, and 17 Fulbright Scholars, and things like that. So, and on top of that, the most important thing is that the university is funded by over 200 individual philanthropic donors who have come together, instead of a single business family running the place, come together to form a board of trustees to run the university as a non-profit organization. And, uh, so, and, and this number is growing. And, and this year, we've received some really big donations from business houses and other uh, philanthropic organizations all over the world. Embedded in this Ashoka environment where students come in without declaring a major, spend three semesters doing foundation courses such as critical thinking, um, you know, quantitative skills, principles of science, great books, culture and civilization, stuff like that. And then uh, slowly then uh, decide what they want to do. Another revolution in, in kind of Indian higher education. A lot of us have gone through uh, such uh, institutions ourselves. Um, they then specialize in a major and minor disciplines, et cetera, et cetera. So this is, this is the idea of Ashoka, but embedded in it now, because research comes in, we have centers such as the center um, that is hosting this event now, CSBC, um, which um, are connected with the academic part of um, the university, as well as you know, it has a, uh, its own agenda funded uh, externally by other organizations. So, for example, CSBC is funded by the Bill and, uh, Melinda Gates Foundation and has its own agenda, as you will hear, of, um, of its research in social and behavioral change and interacts with the government outside the university at various levels, at the federal level through Niti Aayog, at the state level in Bihar and UP, and in increasing uh, ambit in other states, um, looking at um, uh, behavioral change patterns and uh, in, in from, a, from a health perspective as well as economic perspective. Of course, this ambit can also increase. This is so much uh, connected with the core, um, uh, core emphasis of Ashoka. The idea is that one brings together various disciplines and encourages students to think completely in a multidisciplinary manner to particularly focus in between disciplines. I'll give an example of one of our very, um, uh, one of our recent uh, ventures. Um, Ashoka is very, is in Southern Haryana, which is very near the Southern end of where the Harappan civilization remnants are. And our archeology span departments digging in places in swamps and under forests, routinely finding pottery and various other things connected with the, the end of the Harappan era, which can go all the way up to four to 5,000 years ago. Now, because these things are preserved very well, there is evidence of food and human remains 
on these in 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 these 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 um, these fragments. So the biology department has got in and is doing DNA analysis and is starting to find remnants of milk on some of these pottery elements. The first evidence that ev ever human humans consumed milk so so many thousands of years ago. And then the physics department has got in to do some radiocarbon dating. And so here is a good example of how you can get people who teach these subjects at a, at a very um, basic level to do research together. I was giving a course last year on uh, the concept of time, which uh, comes in uh, in so many ways in various fields. So I got together a team of people. So I talked about time as it appears in entropy, uh, the direction of time in thermodynamics, as well as the measurement of time on a universal scale of finding the age of the universe. And my biological colleagues talked about how, how organisms keep time in the circadian rhythm. Um, we had colleagues from economics talk about how time plays an important role in, in financial transactions all over the world. And we had a bunch of 120 students in the class um, in interacting with this material, trying to figure out you know, basic general concepts, irrespective of you know, the subject boundaries that people think about. So this is, this is where, and this is why I think you know, this, this whole subject today that we will discuss of, um, of, of human behavior, of, uh, uh, of how people um, look at uh, the change in behavior, and how people make suboptimal decisions in behavior um, is not just limited to the health sciences as well as economic decisions. As an astronomer, I can tell you I'm just absolutely appalled the way um, humans make suboptimal decisions based on astrological belief um, and how governments make such decisions and how um, government policy often incorporates such decisions. And there are quite a lot of such things that one can look at from um, a lot of um, the disciplines that I talked about that we teach at the university but also do research in um, where um, the, the human behavior and government policy um, can, uh, can be looked at, the interaction between these two systems. And I'm very um, glad that today we've come together to discuss some of the aspects. AI is, of course, one of the things that we've been talking about all year. And, and how that is uh, causing a lot of concern in, uh, in, in academia as well as everywhere. Um, and and I, I look forward to, um, to some of the discussions that will happen today. And I, I'm, I'm here to learn from you and, and take back ideas um, to um, the pedagogy that we do at the university. Um, centers such as this interact with the academic systems very well. Uh, there are quite a lot of other research uh, institutions and centers, such as in the tradition of India, uh, Indian academic system, do not interact very well with undergraduate students and the basic pedagogy. And one of the things that we are seeing that's happening in the Indian edu education system that really excites me is how students are getting involved at a very basic level in research all over the country across subjects, and, and this is a space in which this can happen very well. And so um, I, I look forward to the evening. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Rai um, <clears throat> I, I do wish to, I, I thought I would attend that course on time, uh, especially as it relates to behavioral economics. We have this problem called the time inconsistency problem and so on. And, <clears throat> um, Professor David Halpern, <clears throat> he's the chief executive of the legendary Behavioral Insights team. David Halpern, CBA, is the chief executive of the Behavioral Insights team. David has led the team since its inception in 2010. Uh, he's a good friend of Cass Sunstein, who's also a friend of ours, so he's a friend of our, a friend of ours, and now he's our own friend, so we close the loop from a a social capital point of view, as they say in network theory. Uh, prior to that, David was the first research di director of the Institute for Government, and, be and between 2001 and 2007, was the chief analyst at, at the Prime Minister's Strategy Unit. Um, we have some 
pretty decent connections with the Prime Minister's office these days. I'm sure <coughs> um, you know about that. David was also appointed as, uh, as the What Works National Advisor in July uh, 2013, a position he held until 2022, through which he led efforts to improve the use of evidence across government. Before entering government, David held tenure at Cambridge and posts at Oxford and Harvard. He has written several books and papers on areas relating to behavioral insights and well-being, including Social Capital, 2005, The Hidden Wealth of Nations, 2010, Online Harms and Manipulation, 2019, and co-author of uh, the Mindspace Report. In 2015, David wrote a book about the team uh, entitled Inside the Nudge Unit, How Small Changes Can Make a Big Difference. David was awarded uh, the Commander of the Order of the British Empire in the New York's uh, in the New Year's Honours in January 2022 for public service as What, Wo what Works National Advisor. Um, David, uh, you know, yesterday's conversation you were talking about your work on market mechanism design. That's something that uh, I hope you will speak about at some point during this talk because it's it's deeply intriguing and fascinating, and I'd love to see it uh, being spoken at uh, with a competition commission in India as well. So welcome, David. Very pleased Thank to have you. you. Thank you. Thank you. It is genuinely wonderful to be here and to feel the kind of excitement that you've created, Pavan, and at CSBC and, um, and also Ashoka. Um, so uh, thank you. It's, it's fantastic. Um, actually, you, since you started with Galileo, you made me reflect. I think one of the things in between, you know, what it is we, we try and do, right, is that it may be that Galileo debunked the idea that, you know, mankind and planet Earth wasn't at the center of the universe. But in government, we have to sort of do the reverse often, right? The problem is that government thinks it's the center of the universe and all of you people have to rotate around it, right? You have to bend yourself into the services as opposed to the idea, quite a radical one, which is that why can't services be shaped around our citizens? And I think that's, to go back to your astro reference, it seems to me it's actually quite an interesting one. So, um, yeah, so it gets going, here we go. Oh, no. Uh, you want to just see if you can kick it in? Very good. Thank you. Phew. Um, so what I'm going to try and do, I, I won't do the uh, with very brief introduction, but most pe people in the room know the gist of, I think, what behavioral science is about. But um, what I'll try and do is maybe talk rapidly through the story and about where I think we are now, where we've kind of gone in recent years, and where we're kind of going, some of the exciting areas in the field. So my own journey goes a long way back, of course, I did experimental psych and social psych at Cambridge, and working for Tony Blair, one of the ideas, well, alongside our strategy work, why don't we do something on behavior science? And I tell you a story partly, I think, by the way, I, I respect what it is you do. I know how difficult it is to work <laughs> doing behavioral science and with the prime minister's office sometimes. So we did this document more than 20 years ago, actually, and we talked to Danny Kahneman before he had his Nobel Prize. That's how long ago it was. And we wrote this paper about behavior change. It went badly wrong politically. It had bad reactions. Basically, it killed it for nearly a decade for us overtly using it in policy. Because people were like, oh, you know, what is this? Nanny state, and now you're going to be in our heads as well. We don't really want that kind of thing. So it's not a trivial matter to handle both the science and the politics of this field. Now, that said, starting again, beyond behind, um, 101, if we jump to 2000, um, 2010, I was back in Downing Street, another prime minister, David Cameron, and this coalition agreement, which had used this phrase, perhaps is one you could use here too, our government will find intelligent ways to su encourage, support, and enable people to make better choices for themselves. In other words, it's not that the government will solve every problem, because you're sick, it's not just us always and your doctor. What can you do also to make sure you stay healthy? It's a pretty important idea. I think we probably also got the lesson about the politics a bit more right as well. We had great, a lot of degree of help along the way. This, of course, is our great friend, Richard Taylor, because um, Cass would also come in, but Richard particularly often. 
and we would work together. That's outside Downing Street, for those who don't know, the famous black door and my office inside. And of course, Richard got the, the Nobel Prize, um, and it was a great source of pride to have a Nobel Prize referencing a government unit as part of why Richard got it. Um, so, excited to be here, absolutely, already doing some work. Um, the sheer scale and you know, possibility in India is so palpable. So, with the National Health Agency, um, fantastic, you know, mind-numbing capability about what could be done. Um, of course, with what's happening here inside the administration and CSB, etc., and the BIU, a lot of capability here. You know, it's not, we're not talking, we're not, we're engaging as colleagues who know a lot as well. And of course, your Prime Minister having pushed forward, you know, really highlighting behaviour change as a key tool to fight climate change. By the way, that itself is a brave statement. A lot of, a lot of governments are struggling with this idea, and frankly, including in the British context, is that, no, 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 don't worry, you don't have to change your behaviour. We'll just solve it all with decarbonising the grid and technology. And actually, that's, that's not completely true. It will affect your behavior. There are some things we might have to change. You may have to adopt technology, etc. So it's a brave and important thing for a prime minister to get up and say, it really does involve behavior change. So there's some of the team. You can see them. Actually, they could wave their hands right now, a little clutch. Yeah, there you go. Um, very excited to be here. Um, and we've had a fantastic week already with the number of people who we've been seeing and talking, talking with. And you just, again, feel the capability what could be done, the, the possibilities. And thank you. For, I know some of you in the room, and we really appreciate it. I found it amazingly interesting. So let me go. I'm going to go through two kind of blocks. First of all, I'm going to just tell a bit of an arc to jump into where is it evolving? And I'm sure you're experiencing a very similar story. But as BI teams across the world wrestle with these kind of questions. Um, and then I'm going to talk a bit about some of the issues, Pavan, which you just mentioned, which is some of the, kind of, if you like, slightly more advanced still evolutions of the field. So as I said, from simple, important though that is, the issues about scaling, speed, segmentation, and silicon. We had to have something else, we start with S. <laughs> it's basically technology. Um, so scale, let's just jump in some real examples. Some of you will know one of the very early applications in many government contexts is tax. It may not be the most exciting thing, but it's a very powerful area to realize, as in our very early work, that adding one line to, to writing to people who are late paying their tax, saying, you know, most people pay their tax on time, you're one of the few yet to do so, we found boosted payment rates without any further prompt by 15%. It was massive that one line on letter could do that, right? And by the way, not by threatening you, but by telling you your fellow citizen is more virtuous than you thought they were, and done fast too. So people say, well, will it work elsewhere? We didn't know that, but here's a trial from Indonesia. Look at the scale, more than, this is a trial, a randomized control trial done rapidly with the support of the Global Innovation Fund with more than 10 million people. This was prompting businesses in this case to sign up. At a glance, does it make a difference? Yeah, we test multiple variations. You very rapidly see what will make a difference. Now, they may not look like big percentage points, but when you are talking about tens and, of course, at scale, then applied hundreds of millions of people or businesses, these effects are huge. In this particular case, we found the most effective message was planning. Don't forget to plan ahead. Key thing about behavior, you shouldn't wait until after a business has not got around to paying. Get there before. Don't get into the habit. Prompt in advance. So, you know, a, a very powerful effect and done at scale. Rapidity. Many examples, and COVID, I think, accelerated this still further. A lot of discussions, often when you talk to government, partly because behavioral science has rightly been very empirical, often testing control trials. Oh, that's great. Parvin, thank you so much. You're going to come back when? In two years' time? Sorry. You know, how can you do things much, much faster? So COVID was a good illustration. So this, um, I wonder if, if this works. Yeah. Oh, yeah, look. One of the early things we could do in many countries was ask people, what can you do? First line of defense, and one of the key things, can you wash your hands, right? Be it in India or Bangladesh. Yeah. Um, and this is the UK too. So what would you normally do? You get a people, come to, they, they design a poster. This is the poster which is gonna go out in millions. It's gonna be in every single building in a country. Would it be a good idea to figure out what's the best poster? You'd normally get some creators design it. You maybe have a focus group or two, and then out it goes. Well, surely we could do better. So. So we tested it. We tested it, pre-tested it with thousands of people online. Now, 
in a focus group, you sit there for an hour or two and you look at it very carefully and say, well, I don't like this. That's not how you see a poster. You see a poster for a few seconds, right? You've got maybe two, three seconds. Does the message get through? So we test it. And you can see literally the evolution of this over trials. Um, so look, the early ones, you can't see it very closely, but you get the gist of it. It's, you know, it's got two bits in it. It's got an image. Yeah, what is that even? You can't even tell what it is. It's got lots of logos in it, a lot of text. Well, how many people? They're looking at it for a few seconds. The key message was this. Did they remember it? Did they remember this one? Am I supposed to do these things? You can see it, it evolves over iterations where we test it again, new versions. It rapidly becomes much more simple. Look, get rid of this contrast. What's the main message? Get rid of these extra brands. Simplify it. And then still further, indeed, this is the final poster. You still see this, by the way, if you're wandering around Britain, you will see this poster all over the place. I mean, you might say, oh my goodness, do we really need PhDs to figure it out? Why don't you write the main message really big? Good idea. Get rid of the clutter. Have a simple thing, you know. But, you know, that's not what often happens. But basically, pre-testing, flush out, does it make a difference? Yeah, if you can get to 96% comprehension, you know, that's worth a lot in the field, right? So, very rapid. Segmentation, the next test. So, one of the issues is often, do we treat everybody? Or actually, not everybody's the same. There are different kind of challenges. One challenge many countries are wrestling with, I know in India too, is antimicrobial resistance. You'll know, I mean, on current projections, it's going to kill more people than cancer in <laughs> only 10, 20 years' time. It is absolutely terrifying what it could do to our healthcare systems. So we have run trials, you may know, we did a very famous early one where we would tell doctors, we identify the doctors who prescribe the largest amount, 20%. We don't tell them because we're not any better. We say, did you know you prescribe more antibiotics than 80% of other doctors? And telling them that reduces their prescription rate. Beautiful result. One of the arguments was, well, that's true, but there are certain groups and people for whom that's terrible. You're, they need to be prescribed more. And actually, that's true. So this is some work from, this is New Zealand. It's a powerful illustration. You can see, these are kind of all the different jo doctor, doctor's practices, right? And on this side, this is the average, you know, sort of, you know, where their ranking is in terms of prescription, right? Um, but this is their prescription rates to Maori patients. Now, the background detail, as it turns out, doctors in New Zealand, as in many parts of the world, prescribe too many antibiotics to most people. But the Maori population, they actually don't prescribe enough to them. So there's a good challenge. So can we give feedback? Instead, we do it in this case, where we give feedback relative to most doctors with respect to the majority or the average population, but we also do it with respect to the Maori population. Would it work? Two things at once. Well, I'll show you. So overall prescriptions reduced by nearly 10%. That is massive, by the way. That's a massive, massive effect size. So great, there's the overall change, but what did it do for the Maori population? And you can see it doesn't reduce. If anything, it marginally kicks up. So it's possible to do segmentation and more sophisticated interventions which can operate um, in a differentiated way. Silicon, here's my desperate S, tech if you like. One great example, I think, repersonalization and so on, is the world's getting smarter. You know, there's texts and so on, and how many more texts do you need to tell you that most people are doing this or most people are doing that, which can also therefore be personalized. So this is work, again, in COVID in this particular case, where we're using chatbots um, with people who have yet to have, this is later on in the, in the cycle of COVID, who still haven't had vaccinations. And can a chatbot, you know, work? So first, we think, really systematic test in the world, and the answer is yes, this chatbot which we designed was much better, you know, there's a control group, there's a static message, and there's a chatbot. Significantly better in terms of, this is a percent of people who actually turn up for a vaccination within four weeks. By the way, look to the end, quarter of a million people in this trial alone. Um, we've also actually done this uh, chatbots now in uh, multiple other countries to see and refine, to see if we can get efficacy. So. That's already quite a long way from the simple 101. Important though that was, send a letter, find a better variation. But we were talking about this and we think, well, where next? Where else does it go with? And this is something we often talk with Cass about too. And a key question I want to kind of leave hanging, which is, well, who nudges? Is it, it should Parvin, should, should he be out there nudging you to figure out what's the best to do? Or should it be me? Or who should decide? Why does he know better, right? So let's get into this. 
So one thing, of course, behavioral science has now come together very, very closely with machine learning. This is an early work. Why I also put it in this section is that it's kind of also using, when you say data, it's often using the wisdom of the public too. So if this is a problem trying to identify really bad doctors. In this case, it's 4% of the doctors by our inspectorate. When you go out there, they're really pretty bad. And we've had some pretty bad doctors. We've literally had doctors who've been killing their patients, sadly. Um, so, you know, imagine you take a 20% sample because you can't inspect all of the doctors at once. So at chance, you get, as you can see, 20% of the worst. This black line is the, uh, the regulator sending out its people. It does concentrate its effort a bit. But when we build a machine learning model, concentrating everything we can about populations, including patients' own reporting in various kind of media, we can get to 95% identification of you know, the bad doctors. What does this mean for the, you know, these guys? Well, if you want, you can get rid of two thirds of your inspectors tomorrow because you don't need so many anymore. Or you can identify those doctors and save lives and do interventions. Um, one area which I think is really important also with the Indian stack is that with technology is moving behavioral science into new areas. So one example is gambling. Gambling always used behavioral science. Anybody who went to Vegas will know this, right? You go into a room. Why do you have those giant rooms of slot machines? It's because you can always hear someone winning. It's faulty. Why do they have no windows? Because they want to, you know, make sure that you don't know what time of day it is. It's, it's quite brilliant in lots of ways in a kind of slightly evil way. Now it's gone online, it's even more so. So we are studying this quite carefully to understand, and again, who chooses. I won't go through this whole thing, but we literally take our people, we go through signing up, what's the process, and so on and so on, all the way through, do a few bets, what happens you try and get your money back out and then exit. And all the time we're looking at how behavioral approaches are being used. I mean, a simple example, when you sign up, it's a really good idea, now you're prompted to, you should set your daily limit, right? Pardon, you should set your daily, daily, what do you want to, here it is, the starting point might be $50,000, your daily, $50,000, why do, now they don't really think he's going to spend $50,000, well they'd love it Tim, too, what they're doing is they're using an anchor, because if you say 50000 when you put 1000 it doesn't seem so much, all the way through, very skillful use of behavioral science, who chose it, who designed it, and even by the way, when you get to the end, and you try and get your money back out, boy, try that, sorry, you actually haven't got quite enough money. You need to have, you know, you have to have $20. You have 20 pounds in your account before you can take the money out. Oh dear, well I have to put some more money in. Well I, now it's in, I might as well take another gamble. Let alone when you leave, the approaches which are used to get back to you to hook you back in, right? So it's very powerful stuff. Who chose it? The gamblers choose it? They definitely don't choose it. You try and quit, it's really hard. Smarter regulatory responses. Everywhere you see it, and I see it in industry too. Cookies, all these clicks. Some very clever lawyer, your ex-colleagues. We have a good solution for solving this problem. Every time you go on this site, you're going to have to click this thing. Is that a good idea? Behaviorally? Really? No. We test different variations. Often, of course, you'll notice it's done in different ways. This is, sorry, you'll notice it's in French. This is from our France office. So you can do it in this way. You know, you have it in the same color or whatever. Or what you often see is, you know, that's accept all in bold, and then really a bit quite like, you know, you want to check your choices? That's a dark pattern, we would call it, right? Strongly tilting you towards, you better click here. Here's what we call a bright pattern, which is, it's actually color-coded with, you know, here's the, actually, I don't want it, et cetera, et cetera. Does it make a difference? Yeah, it makes a huge difference, right? When you use, if you like a like pattern, far more people say, actually, I don't want you to have all my information. Far more. But the other detail behind this is what happens is even in a short trial, when you've clicked through a few times, people's anchor point has changed. You've got used to, even after three or four of these things, just click it, oh, accept, 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 right? So instead of this wonderful legal instrument to try and protect us, it's just taught the entire population to ignore it every single time. That definitely doesn't seem the best way. One question coming back to this key, well, who decides? And Rory may speak more about this later, but you know, so young people and digital media, we see it as spreads across the world. We see it also in its shadow, particularly, for example, for young women in relation to self-harm, first in the US, two years later, we see the numbers bumping up in the UK and Western Europe. A couple of years later, well, you can tell me where you are here. And so we started off these discussions, um, well, why don't we go and ask young people? And first it was like, you know, talking about it, but let them understand and explore. 
well, what is it, the logic behind this technology? So if you can understand it, and it's very powerful stuff. One of the examples always streaked in my mind about very popular at the time, and of course it changes every 10 minutes, was the use of it was, um, Snapchat. I don't know how big that was in India, right? Is it been and gone? Is it, what was that? Right. But one of the things is streaks, right? So you're a 12 year old kid, and oh, great, I'm going to do my streak with Power Band. Great, I'll send him my little picture. And of course, I get a streak back and forward. But if I miss it, he'll be annoyed with me. But it's not just Parvan. I've got all my other friends. Now, I've got to get up in the morning, and I've got to send out 100 of these things, right? An hour of my day is gone. It becomes really oppressive, right? Did that kid design it? No, it was designed for them. They all stepped into this world. How do we empower these kids to understand it, reshape it, become digitally literate? So it's great with the kids, but can we also go upstream? This is the point. So here's something, actually, a bigger scale version. Um, we didn't do it, we did it, but we're very supportive of it. Actually, by the Royal Society of Public Health of all people. I said, well, why don't we do a whole load of surveys with 15-year-olds in detail about their experience when they use these different platforms? So here's one from a couple of years ago. This is YouTube. You can't read this very well, but some things, you see there's a big red line that's negative over here. It affects your sleep. All the platforms are designed to like, scroll, keep clicking, the next thing, the next thing. They're not good for your sleep. But a lot of the other ones, if you look at it, are actually quite positive about how you feel about yourself and connect with others and express your identity. So that's YouTube. Let's have a look at this one. This is Instagram, right? Pretty bad for your sleep. Oh, but oh my God, it's bad for us. So here's body image. You know, there's a whole load of other things, fear of missing out. Basically, Instagram, whether intentionally or otherwise, makes you feel awful if you're a 15-year-old girl, right? Why is it the problem of a 15-year-old girl? So what they did is they assimilate this information and then they create a very clear ranking. So now you get out and you put that in the media or everywhere you can and you just say, oh my God, look, look at these difference. Now you're getting a smartphone for your 15 year old. It's like, great, use it. By the way, why don't we agree? Well, let's not use Instagram, right? Now you've made it Instagram's problem, right? Why not fix it upstream? Why not shape that and, and enable people to do it? And still further than that, is how do you empower citizens to shape the shapers? So one, some of you might know, of course, there's a lot of interest around Facebook about the creating of the so-called Supreme Court, right? Which you, kind of quasi-legal, right? Is that you'd have this fantastic thing and it would adjudicate. Meanwhile, you've got the executive over here setting out the rules about you know, what images are acceptable and what are not. And then, okay, well, where do the users sit in that? Where are the users? So the question was, if you think about it in governance term, right, you've got an executive, you've got a you know, you've got a, a judiciary, normally you'd have a legislature in the middle where you get to shape it. So they were very skeptical about this. We have shown, we've done a number of interventions now, you can get users from across the world in different languages, including India, to get together and talk together. Well, what, what should be the rules about fake, and fake news on, you know, green, et cetera, et cetera? And guess what? They come up with really sensible things and meta like, wow, we didn't, we thought it'd be way too complicated for our users to understand. We have to do it by engineers. No, this is about people's lives, they're human beings. So this, we think, is a really powerful intervention, which is design, as you work, regulatory or governance interventions, which enable the public to shape the forces that shape them. Why, why not be that, the game? OK, so in conclusion, um, one just thing to remark on, we should at least say, there are definitely ongoing challenges, one of which anyone in behavioral science is aware of. There's now been several issues around data, Brian Wansink, some might remember about, you know, that amazing body of work. Oh, it's too good to be true. Dan Ariely, I mean, that went right around the world. We ourselves, by the way, we knew damn well, we were, in fact, Rory literally was involved in some trials where we were testing some of these things about signing the name up front, and they weren't really working. So, in fact, one of, a person, a PhD student working with us, started to dig into the other data and then raise the issue. Now, of course, Francesco Gino. So, we should be really serious about it. It reinforces why you should have registries, et cetera, but let's not go crazy. So my last kind of image almost is this one, and award to anybody who knows what this is. We'll send you a free copy of Inside the Nudge Unit. Do you know what this is? A very important piece of equipment. You know what this is, so you know what? Do you know what any I guess is, it's bellows? I'll give you a clue, it's from about 1750. So it's quite old, it is bellows, that's a part of it, but what's bellows for what? No? It's not a fireplace, if only that was when I tell you the answer. So, you all know the expression, 
when I'm trying to tell Pavan, he is so great. He's so great. I'm going to, I'm going to blow smoke up his, up his bottom, right? When you're trying to, you think, well, that's an interesting expression. Have you ever thought about where he came from? This, this was a medical treatment. Blowing smoke up your bottom was a medical treatment. If you fell into the River Thames or some other city in Europe, the treatment for drowning was tobacco smoke blown into any orifice they could find, which certainly included your bottom. Now, we think that's really ridiculous. The question for so much of government and policy is, it's full of things that are probably like that, that in future generations, they're going to go, oh my god, you used to do that, but you never tested or evaluated it. So the lesson of these challenges with you know, the evidence shouldn't be we give up on evaluation. We should be doubling down on the empiricism of government. Because the world is full of things which future generations will say, oh my god, you used to. <laughs> so can India leapfrog? I mean, that's what's uh, is so fascinating, so important. We think you probably can. Simple is good on behavioral science. It really is. But four S's is better. Scale, speed, segmentation, silicon, tech, right? It's, there's, there's ways of really it's moving forward fast. There's this argument about individual versus system. It's individual and system, folks. Ideally, particularly when it tilts, we, we support people to make individual changes, which then change the system, right? That's really powerful, be it reformulation of products or making them greener, etc. Especially if we can build into it some capacity for citizens to shape the shapers. And I think one of the most important things we do in our work is we actually make citizens aware of these forces that are influencing so they can choose. They can choose whether the chips or the salad come first. It's not for us, but we can give them that information, right? And then they can make judgments. And then finally, I would just say is, even if you don't care about behavioral science, one of the wonderful things behavioral science has done across the world is it's acted as a Trojan horse for really sharp forms of empiricism, right? And you'd like to think that's how all government is, but it really isn't, we all know. And one, I think, challenge I've definitely been discussing with a few folks is we should collaborate. We should collaborate and we should share the evidence. You know, the fact is, your kids find learning trigonometry and algebra hard. Guess what? So do ours. What's the best way of teaching a kid, right? What's the best way of adopting a net zero product? How do we signal and improve market functioning? You know, we should collaborate around building this evidence base together. And we can really, really change the world. Thank you. There now and we'll have time for question after that. Yeah, I mean, so do we have any time for Q and A now, okay. for five minutes? Uh, please, Saksham, check. Uh, hi, uh, Professor. Great, great, great talk. Uh, and you know, uh, so. One of my colleagues and I, Anirudh, and I wrote, wrote an article on gambling platforms in India a few years back. And one of the comments from the industry itself received was that this is a growing industry. And you know, so why do you want regulation to kick in early on? I mean, that's just a comment we received. But you know, the, the BIT's approach was to actually also get them on the table, bet, three, bet 365 or whatever else the players were. And you, know, you build a consortium to drive policy change. So could you offer some insights on, especially these tricky regulatory spaces on consumer protection? If you have any insights to offer, there, I'll, I'll be really, you know. So we're very interested in this. Um, should I stand or? Yeah. Um, you can, you can but, um, well, um, so yes, gambling is an extreme form of it, right? Because it, it is so intense in its use of behavioral science. And, and it's genuinely cruel. You, I don't know if you hear the same stories here, but you, in the policy in many, you literally have someone coming in, someone who's saying, if only with my husband it had been heroin, it would have been better. We've lost the house, the marriage is gone. Not everyone's vulnerable in that way, but it is, it is really quite nasty and, and potentially. Some people enjoy it and it's fine. So you can see how, of course, I mean, an illustration would be, you can use a lot of behavioral science and data science to work out what kind of gambler you are. In the same way it was true for casinos. They want to find out, if Parvin's coming to town, what you really want is someone who's rich and not a very good gambler. <laughs> you want to give him the presidential suite. Now you can do that online. You can work out how good someone is. And indeed, some of these sites will work out. If you are a good, skilled gambler, they will literally limit your bets. Well, if you can do it for a good, why can't you do it the other way around, right? So regulatory practice, which is more skillful, one of the, the challenges is you end up playing whack-a-mole. 
You <laughs> make one change here, one change here. And so how do you work out, is this a good or a bad provider? And operate, hence, at more market level. So we, for example, changed what was our competition commission and replaced it with a new institution called the Competition and Markets Authority, which we continue to evolve, which is to get ahead of it. And the fact that, for example, in this and many other markets, you have many providers who are competing, that doesn't mean that you have, it's all good, right? You can find equilibrium in markets because of so-called behaviorally based market failures, where it's kind of really bad for everyone. And you need a more sophisticated approach, which is not markets are great always, or we hate markets, let's shut them down. We have to be curators of markets to help shape them, and ideally to enable our citizens to shape them in a way which is, you know, so simply on gambling, I know we should move on, but so when you're a gambler and you've had enough, you need to be able to say, I've had enough. And a gambling company needs to never be allowed to approach you again, right? That is not the world we live in at the moment, right? But that would be about active market design. And by the way, if the gambling company we don't trust, why not your bank? Why can't you say to your bank, for God's sake, I never want to gamble again. It's got your money, right? It might be other things too. Never let me buy anything between midnight and six o'clock in the morning. It was never a good purchase, right? And then designing sort of a psychology of commitment devices is when you change your mind, how do you handle it, right? So we've got to be more sophisticated about market design. Yes, sir. If you can speak loudly enough, I'm sure we'll be able to hear you. Uh, <clears throat> please allow me to be a little provocative. You know what I, I the way I see it, this whole behavioral insight work, you know, and especially the interface with policy. My understanding is that somehow economics has been traditionally closest to policy making, and economics largely has been driven by very simple assumptions about human behavior, and, and to the extent of mathematizing everything, I think it was Kahneman and later on Taylor. And then, of course, you, you're not touching on another stream of behavioral insight, which comes from Abhijit Banerjee. Uh, that, uh, you know, as I have been a professor of management, and I think my marketing colleagues were all the time doing, they were trying to influence the customer. They were wanting him to buy something and not buy something else. So I'm glad that economists have opened up to looking at human beings as human beings rather than as automatons driven by selfish motives, very, very simplistic things. So I would like to know what is it that you are doing which was not being done before? Good question. Do you want to answer it? <laughs> no. The, um, Yes, no, you're quite right. I mean, going right back to the 1930s, marketers learned this. You learned it's very hard to predict, you know, which would message would respond. So a lot of it is communications-based. But a partial answer to your question is um, it's not only about communications. So a lot of it is about so-called choice architecture. So the classic example is the canteen, do you come to the chips or the salad? That is a choice architecture change. It's not just communications. Or some of these issues to do with market design um, you know, let me give, just extend the example before. Once you decide, sir, that you, you had enough gambling, you tell your bank. The bank has to, well, what do I do when you change your mind? So then you get into the business of what are called commitment devices. So we might say, well, if you change your mind, when you signed up to say never gamble, you would also tick the box, which is, you change your mind, it, uh, it's going, a message is going to your son or your daughter, or maybe your mother, depending, and with a three-day delay. Right? That would be an example of a commitment device so that it would kind of help shape your behavior. But it wouldn't be normally captured by communications, right? So it's, it's a whole range of tools which come in around, you know. One last thing to say is, of course, that's absolutely true for economics and a simple, um, I think many economists now are overly simple. Let's not let lawyers off the hook. <laughs> the lawyers also have a pretty simple idea, which is if we pass this law in the parliament, that the world will all change. It turns out that's not always true. 
not everybody will do what you say. So I do think in the same way, you know, I often say, our children will look back and just say, what were you doing? But you didn't evaluate. You had these crazy theories, which you think about for 10 seconds. If even economists, they start seminars and they say, these are my assumptions. Obviously, we know they're not true, but I'm going to carry on. Like, well, excuse me, imagine we did some assumptions which were realistic. So, look, I think it, is, it does add stuff, but there is some of those methodological roots, which, of course, you can see in nascent form in marketing and, indeed, other fields, too. Thank you. Um, just one, uh, may I request uh, Professor Rai Chaudhary to talk a little about the investments that Ashoka is making, the ex extensive investments it's making into computer science, AI, and ML, and how that's shaping up, because... Uh, CSBC has also made a few investments and we've built an AI ML model uh, to predict anemia, for instance, or to detect uh, domestic violence. I'd love to hear you uh, mention Ashoka's efforts in that direction because then I think there's a nice natural point for us to converge. Yeah, of course. I, 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 and thanks for bringing that up. Uh, I, um, one of the things I tried to mention in, uh, in this, uh, this kind of model of building the university that we are now doing is to actually find um, subject areas in which very naturally uh, many disciplines come together, uh, in particular disciplines across uh, humanities, social sciences, and, and the physical sciences. And AI, of course, is one of the, one of the very um, important fields in that. So we've taken up uh, AI ML as one of the overarching themes of the university. Uh, that will come into both the, the undergraduate teaching as well as uh, and research. So the idea is then that um, we now have several centers um, like yours, but uh, based on campus, um, uh, driven by academics, um, one from the computer science department, one from the biology department, one from economics, um, where um, uh, these are essentially looking at general uh, problems in AI ML, but looking at then the, um, the applications in the research in various fields. In particular, we're looking for problems in which one can, because one of the strengths in Ashoka is that we have a very large number of very smart undergraduates who are looking for things to do, looking for things to do outside their, uh, the classroom exercises. And, and, and so, um, there are a bunch of uh, undergraduates together, teams who are working on problems uh, which would be either to generate data uh, so that AI ML algorithms can, can, can be used on them and vice versa. Now, <clears throat> there are very interesting things, I mean, uh, where we talk about, um, when we talk about even in economics, when you're talking about decisions, predict, uh, predicting decisions, one looks at decisions that are not completely deterministic in terms of numbers, but can be quantified only as a range of numbers, mm -hmm. right? And this is a direct problem of, of, of the kind of uh, decision making that you, you're talking of in economics. This happens also in, um, in the health sciences or in the natural sciences, where the outcome of a particular experiment is not just one single number, but has a number with an error bar on it or a range. And natural AI ML problems, uh, algorithms can't deal with such things very well. Because then it goes into a probabilistic way of, of dealing with numbers. And the modeling then doesn't deal with, it uh, doesn't you know, fit to a whole bunch of uh, exact numbers. But then in multidimensional space, it's going to have ranges of numbers. And in many cases, these numbers would be missing. And in many cases, these numbers would not be found because they're outside the range in which you looked. So this is statistically, and in terms of machine learning, a very, very interesting emerging problem. And you need statisticians to work on them, or, com or machine learning experts to work on them. But you can't work in a space where there are no real data. Mm. So here comes our health sciences department. We are building a whole department of digital health where people are gathering together multidimensional data sets which come from hospitals, which come from medical experiments. There's a whole bunch of people who are out there with uh, wearable devices that are giving us 24-hour data uh, about their lifestyle. And then there, there are 
people who look at their nutrition, people who look at their diseases, and this huge data set uh, that, that is being generated out of this has to be corralled into uh, something in which you can actually use AIML techniques. So you can see the, the, the confluence of having a large bunch of students who can do useful things in gathering data, as well as people who can then um, sit at the advisory level, telling different departments how to use AIML techniques in their research. And this is where, of course, your activity comes in, because we have a set of AIML experts who come from the machine learning background who are working on the theory on how to implement them in practical data sets where this kind of peculiarities to do with the domain exist. Mm -hmm. So your, the economics problems will be very different from the health sciences problems, will be different from astronomy, where I'm looking at a star behaving in the same way right. you know, as, a, as a function of time. And, uh, and I've got data from stars doing that. And, and so I, I use the same techniques. Uh, and I find, for example, I went into machine learning as an astronomer looking at how some um, psychologists were working with EEG data, which looked exactly like how a black hole uh, system <laughs> behaves uh, around a star, um, giving out energy, uh, because we're looking at underla how underlying models can be inferred from data, temporal data, right? So, the, uh, the methods are very, same, very similar, the algorithms are very similar. Often, in an abstract way, the problems to, of data are very similar. And, and, and so what we've done is, uh, university-wide, we've set up units which will essentially develop the theory and then um, interact with centers such as yourselves looking at the actual data. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Um, that's, that's fascinating. Um, I hope the stars are raw more predictable and less crazy than human beings. And uh, uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, I, I think we should, in the interest of time, perhaps go to the next segment where we have a distinguished panel. Oh, yes, we, we, we have a token of uh, gift for both our. Uh, okay. So since you are a guest, you get it first, uh, David. And, uh, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much for a, a great conversation. Thank you. Uh, may I invite the, the panelists to come and join us? So. Hi. Very good afternoon. Uh, very good evening to all of you. And um, before kicking off this panel discussion, let me do a round of introduction. Uh, I'm Shagoto Mukherjee. I'm the academic lead of the Behavioral Insights Unit of India at Niti Aayog, and a deputy director at the Center for Social and Behavior Change, Ashoka University. And tonight, I have the very exciting task of moderating this panel discussion on development challenges and behavior change, where we will have a lively discussion on the current state of behavior science in India, where it's headed, and its uh, role in addressing development challenges through behavior change. And to talk about all these topics and more, we have a stellar panel with us today. And uh, so let me start by introducing our panelists. Our first panelist is Dr. Rory Gallagher. Rory leads BIT's work across Australia and Asia Pacific and has been with BIT since its inception in 2010. He's also the founder and board member of Systems2, a new sister not-for-profit organization tackling some of the most complex social problems through an understanding of human behavior. Based in Sydney since November 2012, Rory led the establishment of the New South Wales Department of Premier and Cabinet's Behavioral Insights Unit, the first Australian agency dedicated to applying BI to public policy. Rory holds a PhD in Health and Behavior Change from Cambridge University. He has been a visiting fellow at the Singapore Civil Service College since 2014 and an honorary member of the University of Melbourne School of Psychological Sciences since 2018. He's the co-author of the book Think Small, the surprisingly simple ways to reach big goals. Welcome, Rory. Our second panelist is our second panelist is Urvashi Vatal. Urvashi is the associate director of policy at JPAL South Asia, where she leads strategic planning and day-to-day -day management of the policy vertical at JPAL South Asia, which works to promote the use of scientific evidence in policy making. Prior to joining JPAL, she worked as an evaluation and research manager at Catalyst Management Services in India. Urvashi holds a master's in development studies from TIS Mumbai and a bachelor's in economics from international studies 
uh, from McAllister College, St. Paul in the US. Welcome, Urishi. Our third panelist is Neerad Bhatnagar. Neerad is a partner at Dalberg Advisors where he leads the global water practice and focuses on driving innovations across topics including behavior change. Along with CSBC, he's the founder of the behavioral platform, the At Atlas of Behavior Change and Development, also known as ABCD. Neerat is keen on leveraging technology, design, and innovation to further the adoption of behavioral approaches in development. He's also the founder of a social venture called Belong that focuses on intersectional inclusion within development. Neerat studied at IIT Kharagpur and IIM Bangalore and spent several years in management consulting and technology entrepreneurship before following his heart into the world of social innovation. Welcome, Neerat. Our fourth panelist is Radharani Mitra. Radharani is a global creative advisor at BBC Media Action and is widely considered to be a marketing and communications guru with two decades of experience in advertising. She is a leading voice in the SBCC sector, designing strategic and creative solutions using human-centered design and tell stories across new and legacy platforms to bring about social and behavior change. From 360 degree campaigns to TV and web dramas, from mobile services to social media campaigns. She has created transmedia brands and characters, now household names in many Indian states, as well as in other countries across Asia and Africa, and has a track record of designing scalable, impactful, and award-winning creative solutions. Welcome, Radharani. Our final panelist is Professor Shujoy Chakraborty. Shujoy received his PhD in economics from Purdue University in the US in 2002 and has since been a faculty member at the University of Texas at Dallas, IIM Ahmedabad, IIT Delhi, and JNU, where he's currently professor of economics and teaches a course on behavioral and experimental economics. His research interests include experimental and behavioral economics, particularly in a development context. His largely interdisciplinary body of research has been published in top scientific journals in the world, such as Nature Scientific Reports, Journal of Behavioral and Experimental Economics, and GIBO, among many others. Welcome, Shujai. So Shujai, I want to start with you first. Um, so as we know, most of the literature in behavior science is based on studies that have been conducted in the so-called weird countries, that is, Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and, develop and democratic countries. Now, as a behavioral scientist, how much of that literature do you think is directly implementable in a non-weird country context, such as in India? Um, when can these behavioral insights be applicable in the Indian context? And when, maybe not so much? OK, that's, sorry. Am I audible? Yeah. OK. So uh, this is a, um, for those of you who don't know the book, this is, uh, and the research by Noren Zayan and, and uh, Joe Hendrick, who, uh, which is on this idea that uh, most of the data from, from behavioral experiments are from the global north, where, um, you know, with a certain type of population. So when a certain project tried to replicate these in the early 2000s with guys like Bowles, Gintis, and people in Africa, they found that there was a huge variation, of course, in behavior, which included values, morals, attitudes, you know, dishonesty levels, preferred dishonesty levels, um, identified dishonesty, things like that. So there was a huge sort of re-evaluation. And I feel that uh, since then, of course, Joe Hendrick has come up with a really well-known book now. And the main difference is, I think, in the global south, uh, things work in groups. And context is all important. So you don't have the field independence that you have in the global north, where you can, you know, I don't think these theories work anyway in the global north, but I think they have no chance of working in the global south. Because most human beings in the global south don't have moral absolutism. They don't make decisions individually. So if you go and give somebody a nudge, if his chacha ji tells him, hey, you know, wrong move, you know, then he's not going to take the nudge. So. You know, we have to, I feel, in a global con, I mean, in the Indian context at least, frame our behavioral interventions in a slightly different way. If you're now going to go and look at individual optimizers, satisficers, maximizers, whatever, you're not going to get anything because, or you're going to get mild effect, as Chater and Lowenstein say, that you'll get modest 
little gold. So, I, I'm, I mean, this is not new, actually. I mean, there are a whole lot of work, Ackerloff, Cranton, and all these guys talking about how identity modifies our behavior in economics, actually, from a long time ago. Um, they all talk about that, that, you know, it, there's an individual component of behavior, and there is a social context. So, a lot of individual behavior is moderated or mediated through the social context. And I, and I think our new surveys uh, and, you know, survey experiments and things need to take this into account. How so? By actually trying to map the context. So in order to explain what are individual decisions as richer decision contexts, you know, where you take into account family units, peer groups, peer networks, etc. So does that answer some of it? Okay. Thanks, thanks, Shujai. Uh, is my mic working? You can hear me at the back. Okay. So maybe I'll take a cue from, from your answer, Shujai, and come to you, Rory. So Shujai talked about, uh, uh, about the social context. Um, so Rory, you have been uh, involved with the BIT since its inception in, in 2010. And as we know, BIT started its work um, in the UK, but now spread uh, across the world and working in many countries. So in your studies uh, with individual behavior change across different countries and contexts, how do you incorporate the influence of culture and social norms in them? Thanks so much for the question and for the, uh, the invite. <clears throat> and also, it's just great to see such a stellar audience here, which I think reflects the energy and the quality of this, this field in India at the minute. Certainly, if David was doing a talk with me on a Friday evening in the UK, we wouldn't pull such a stellar crowd. So it's a real, it's a real honor to be here. Um, and as, as David set out and, and, and the question sort of highlights. We've been doing this, you know, for the first decade in the global north. And that was really quite deliberate to test, do these methods work? You know, lots of stuff worked, but lots of stuff didn't. And, you know, we come here now with great humility to try and understand and work with not just experts on this panel, but, but also in the audience today to work out how do we apply these techniques here in India and learn from the work that's been going on in the last decade here. But in terms of individual versus social, it's a healthy debate that Chater and Lowenstein have, have raised, but, but I think we refute that, you know, most of the work looks at both of those things together. Very few bits of our work ever looks at an individual as a sort of atomic, a sort of an individual unit. We're always trying to understand the social network and, and the system. And, and the way that we do that, to, to draw on Pavan's sort of early metaphor, is it, both observational and it's experimental. And an early phase of our research to try and understand those cultures and practices is called explore. And it's to do exactly that, to listen deeply to the qualitative and the quantitative, to listen to people and the data about what is really, what is really going on. And, and just to maybe try and make that concrete with a couple of examples that David referenced and I was personally involved in, antimicrobial resistance. You saw the, the plot chart there. It wasn't just enough to know that Mary Pacificas you know, sort of react differently. We need to really understand how that played out. But then we need to engage with the medical profession and the Marion Pacifica health community to work out how do we communicate this and work very carefully. And one of the real fears, particularly from the medical practitioners, is they would get these graphs and the medical professionals would freak out and they'd want to speak to someone and, and check the data and they'd want to call to someone. So we had to find a, a, a sort of call, a hotline that we could man to answer these questions in case there was a sort of big reaction. There was hardly any. And when, it was, when, we did, when that hotline did get calls, it was to say what a, what a good intervention this was, right? But we had to think through what are the medical practices and cultures that we are trying to influence here. The, the second example, Digital Compass, uh, the program that we do with young people to understand how they navigate the online world. When we spoke to young people, the first big thing that they said is, everyone comes into schools and tell us what not to do. Get off your phone, don't go on Instagram, right? Tell us what we can do, tell us what we should do, and let us debate and discuss that. And also, let me know myself. Tell me about my data. How do I compare to my peers in my usage? And we use that and combine that with the data that, that David showed to say, OK, you spend a lot of time on Instagram. Well, this is what the evidence suggests. You might want to think about that. But it's also true that people don't always understand their own behavior, right? So we, we complement that with an understanding of the literature. So in this case, we knew it was a really interesting study around teenagers um, understanding and, and reactions to junk food. There are lots of messages, don't eat junk food, fall on deaf ears. But when you talk to teenagers about, well, these are the tactics that the fast food giants are using, they really engage. They don't like to be manipulated. So we use that exact technique here to say, well, let's show them what Snapchat, what Instagram are doing. And, uh, and that was very, very 
uh, powerful. So I think the key for us is to be endlessly curious, to endlessly explore, whether that's you know, farmers in Indonesia, whether that's domestic violence, uh, uh, victims, perpetrators in Chile, or now here in, in India. You know? and, and that's, again, where we can do some of this directly, but most, most likely we're going to need to partner to really understand you know, why are citizens not using the health insurance scheme, right? And the one final point is that most people then just go to the citizens, right? We think that's who we need to talk to. That's the culture and practice. But as important is the supply side. Why is that frontline worker refusing to use it? Sometimes the incentives are right. Sometimes it's just paperwork, right? It's hassle for me to go and do that. And we really need to understand both the citizen side and the supply side if we're to understand those cultural practices. Thanks, thanks, Rory. Uh, that's very interesting. So Rory talked about uh, the understanding the citizen side and the supply side together. Um, so I'm going to come to you, Radharani, on, on this point, um, as, uh, because you actually do this. Uh, so as an SBCC expert, can you tell us a little bit about how you use SBCC, that is social and behavior change communication, um, as an effective and integral part of the broader behavior change narrative, incorporating you know, the culture context that we are talking about? Uh, and how do you see its impact on the ground? Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Can you hear me at the end of the room? Yes. Uh, thank you. It's really great to be in this room. And um, I don't at all feel like an expert sitting with so many um, academic giants. Um, but um, you know, all through my working life, whether it was in creating brands or, and selling them or designing solutions for social and behavior change, mining behavioral insights has been central to my training and discipline. And uh, at PPC Media Action, we really rigorously uh, go through the entire continuum of the science, art, and craft of designing change, you know, keeping the audiences at the heart of everything we do. So, you know, really immersing ourselves in not only individuals, but communities, the context, and all of that. Um, I know that time is very short, so I'm going to touch on a couple of points, not more. And I thought I'd talk about context, because I do believe context is king, but you've already spoken about that, and Rory also mentioned it. So I'm going to get to the business of the counterfactual. Um, and uh, there was this man called George Lois, a luminary from the Mad Men era, who said that communication must act as a compass. Um, indeed, storytelling of any kind affords us the opportunity of you know, creating alternate realities. And we have used that quite effectively, um, of course, after learning about um, audiences and what they consume um, in uh, you know, uh, designing solutions. Um, because what storytelling lets us do is to um, basically you know, model solutions and portray uh, sort of deviance. And we've done that time and again. Um, and I'm going to take the example of this birth spacing campaign that we did, Ekteen Do Faide Ka Mantra, or 132, the mantra of benefits. Um, you'll see in this campaign, and it was done as a multimedia thing across formats, but if you see the, uh, uh, the, the TV ad, you'll see a young Indian rural couple sitting in a field having a very intimate and sensuous conversation about desire and about the benefits of waiting for their second baby. This doesn't really happen, does it? I mean, you don't see this happening in rural India. But it was necessary for us to actually portray that conversation to model interspousal communication and uh, you know uh, basically uh, basically position the benefits because they are talking about financial benefits that are immediate and not health benefits that are distal and in the future about having more resources at hand if they wait for their second child and um, it was important for us to do this because uh, I think you know health had been the primary benefit offered in family planning communication historically in this country and, and in many other countries. Uh, so what this couple does and what communication and the behavioral insight or the fact that this is, this is modeling something else and not just a mirror image of what reality offers, what it enabled us to do was to uh, basically, uh, you know, uh, just to sort of 
help us create characters or create a story where this couple is actually uh, building a value proposition for people like them uh, that, that makes for a compelling argument or a compelling sort of you know, reason for them to you know, stave off the enormous normative pressure of having a second male child. Now, this is an example of how we use behavioral insights or principles of behavioral science in, you know, designing our content. But there's also equally, um, a, you know, a significant use of behavioral insights in um, taking decisions on implementation. So, for example, when we were designing the national version of Kilkari, our D2C mobile health service, we, through iterative user testing and studying mobile usage by families, by families I mean the man and the wife, we concluded that the service had to call a family up to seven times in three days for the call to be received. Of course, I mean, the call can be received at the first shot. So this uh, service, this was when we were designing the national version of it because it's been scaled up by the government of India. And now it reaches 2.5 million families every week, making it the largest health service, uh, messaging, health messaging service in the world. And uh, what, what it showed us was, and it has been, you know, we have sort of done this time and again through user testing, prototyping to learn about what works and what doesn't. And the examples are numerous from, you know, my experience at BBC Media Action across many, many countries. And of course, you know, we can, we can sort of share examples and share the learnings we have had. There's been a slew of papers in BMG, BMJ on the, on the national scale up of Kilkari and Mobile Academy. And, you know, other papers on the work we have done on fecal sludge management or gender and adolescence. So, yeah, there are all these lessons that we keep learning and we keep building on. And sometimes, of course, the, the older lessons change with the changing context, you know. So it's constant sort of, you know, uh, sort of, uh, it's, it's, we are learning as you go, right? Uh, thanks, thanks, Radharani, for, for sharing those. I think that's very interesting about what you say, uh, to go from what is to what could be through, through your campaigns. Um, let me uh, come to you now, Neerat, and uh, ask you a slightly broader question. Um, as, in some sense, the industry representative in this panel, um, what role do you see industry can play and or is already playing um, in addressing development challenges through behavior change in India? Uh, thanks. Uh, so, so let me zoom out. Being a consultant, I like zooming out. So I, I think uh, if folks know, SDG 5 is gender equality, right? Now, in the development space, uh, gender is both a vertical, but it's also a horizontal, right? So you actually have, you need to apply a gender lens for agriculture, for healthcare, for education. In the same way, I think, behavior is both a vertical and a horizontal, right? So if you look at our work in at Dahlberg, and we work with industry, we work with philanthropy, uh, we think that most development problems uh, get solved when four things come together. So one is policy and regulation, number two, money, finance, and number three, the right technical solution, and number four, the right behavioral solution. But you need financing for behavior, you need policy for behavior, you need the technical inf infrastructure to deliver behavioral intervention. So it's both of that. Now with that as, as context, uh, coming to your question, what role can industry play? So first of all, the space of develop, what is development and what is not development is the boundary between development and non-development non is blurring, right? Uh, let's say 30 years ago, 50 years ago, those two things were very different. But now you have concerns like climate change, you have concerns like water, you have concerns like transportation. And they are seeing so much activity by all kinds of actors, including private actors. In fact, private actors are taking a lead role in many of these things. Uh, and the thing about private actors is that they have the cleanest incentives to know their customers the way, best, right? Because there's a profit motive. In development or in, or in uh, government, the person who funds the program is not the person who privately benefits from that program succeeding. I mean, very rarely in go government you actually get a million dollar bonus. Uh, or, and similarly, you have three different kinds of uh, actors who come together in development, right? So you've got the pair. Uh, a donor, let's say, you've got the user and you've got some intermediary like us, uh, and often the incentives don't align. So, so the cleanest incentives are for the private sector to discover who the user is, what behaviors they enact, 
And hence, over time, they've really invested in that, right? Which is why the field of marketing uh, is where a lot, a lot of this thinking comes from, which is why they've, and they have the money because of the profit motive. They have the money to invest in these tools. A lot of the AI uh, sort of uh, innovations we're seeing right now is really, frankly, because of uh, marketing, social marketing, and the, uh, and uh, actually to take the physics analogy further, uh, Pawan and Dr. Chaudhary, I think AI is nothing but the reduction of entropy, right? So you're sort of taking a large kind of uh, meaningless mass of data and you're trying to detect patterns and then you're trying to generate signals from that pattern. And that's what the private sector is really good at doing. And I think we, over time we'll see a lot of that coming into uh, behavioral science for development. Uh, and, and I'll t talk about what we're trying to do uh, towards that, uh, I suppose if you have time. All right, thanks, thanks, Neerat. Uh, I'll come back to you on the AI bit. I'm not gonna let you go so easily. Uh, but uh, let me go to Urvashi. Um, so Urvashi, uh, David in his uh, wonderful keynote lecture talked about the fact that how behavior science has also um, uh, kind of helped in, in general empiricism and evaluation, right? And, and put the focus on that. Um, so as we all know, JPAL has been one of the driving organizations on, um, on impact evaluation, randomized control trials, and you have also worked with uh, many policymakers. So my question to you is two-pronged. Uh, first is, how much do you think it's important for policymakers to scientifically and rigorously um, evaluate behavior change interventions? Um, and on the other side, given the time and resource constraints that typically bureaucrats and policymakers face to drive change on ground, how can researchers and organizations be sensitive to the needs of the government? Um, thanks, Shagatha, and it's great to be here uh, with all of you. So I think I've been, uh, this is sort of the uh, the challenge or the area that I've been working on the most at JPAL is sort of working with policymakers, governments, to set up evaluations to answer their questions um, uh, for the outcomes that they're trying to drive, right? Uh, and I think to the first part of your question, I think impact evaluations can be a really powerful tool for policymakers, not just to identify what works, what's an effective program, but to also know what doesn't work. I think going back to uh, David's presentation earlier and the example of the bellows, the government has incredible amount of resources at their disposal. Uh, you know, I, I won't name the state, but we were um, in a government meeting last week where we were presenting a proposal for an evaluation. We said that this is the budget that we need to do this study. And it's very easy for them to say yes to it because they're spending something like 100 times on the actual programs that they're running, right? And so if that money is being spent on something which actually doesn't work, that's a huge loss. And I think that's the sort of strongest um, contribution to evaluating that you know, policymakers can benefit from. And it's work that we've been doing a lot. So for example, one of the seminal work that JPAL has done on health is actually disproving certain widely held beliefs, right? So there was a time when there was a very strong view that you know, uh, if you charged a little bit of a, a sum for preventive healthcare products, you know, bed nets, soaps, um, chlorine tablets, etc., maybe the people who really uh, need it will buy it and they'll actually use it. Uh, and there were a series of evaluations done, um, and, and there was very strongly held beliefs and perhaps well-intentioned beliefs, right? That you target the people who want it the most, they will pay for it. And what we saw evaluation after evaluation is that even a very small price, even something which is a cost, a fraction of the cost of the product, really brings down uh, uh, demand, right? It's like a classic demand curve. And so giving those products away for free because these are preventive healthcare products is perhaps like more cost effective and that's a very powerful insight, right? It really shifts the way people are trying to address this problem. So I think it's a very powerful tool uh, in the hands of policymakers. It can help make the right decisions, but like you rightly pointed out, there's also the flip side of it, right? Which is timelines. Um, we work a lot with governments, we work mostly in states and we are sort of interacting with, you know, your like, principal secretary, additional secretary, ACS health or uh, you know women and child development that person is there in that position for sometimes at best nine months 12 months um, they have a limited window of time uh, they have to show results 
uh, in that time, right? And they have pressure to do that. Uh, and when we are sort of proposing evaluations which are going to take a year, two years, three years, they're not going to be around, uh, you know, once the results come out. And that's, that's not taking into account sometimes things like publication timelines, which can be even much longer than just doing the evaluation itself, right? So I definitely think there is a need and also, uh, you know, a, a real purpose for organizations that are in this space to try to condense these timelines. I right? think about how we can do some of these evaluations quicker while maintaining uh, rigor uh, and also putting pressure to share those findings quicker, uh, right? And, and that's something we're trying to do at JPAL uh, because otherwise it's, you know, if you want to use that policy window, if you want that evidence to matter, like missing those timelines is sort of not an option. Right, thanks, thanks so much, uh, Urvashi, for that. Um, so now I uh, want us to discuss a little bit on the ethics of nudging. Um, so David uh, also talked about, uh, um, about this a little bit. And in dialogues such as these, uh, one question that often comes up is, uh, is it ethical for governments to nudge their citizens? Um, somebody would say uh, that at one level, isn't this just some form of manipulation? So I'll start with you, Rory, on this, um, because I'm sure in your work uh, with BIT this has come up. So how would you respond to this question that, um, is it ethical for behavioral insights units like us to nudge people? Thanks. Um, yeah, look, this, this criticism definitely does come up, but it's become much more muted over time. And you know, when we were first set up in the UK, the US, Singapore, and no one had really heard of behavioral science at the heart of government. And I think they sort of assumed there was these very clever sort of evil scientists at the heart. And then they met David and me and they thought, you know, how much trouble could these guys really do? Um, but in all seriousness, we, we, we deliberately met with a journalist when we put out one of our first papers. And we sat them down and we showed them, this is what the letter looked like. This is what it looked like now. And actually just showing what this actually looks like in real life. This is making it easier or nicer, this letter actually dissipated a lot of those fears. And, and a slight aside on the, on the experimentation too, they were very nervous when we put out that first paper that we were testing, that we were treating the public like guinea pigs. And there was this real fear that, well, if I send a letter to you and it says nine out of 10 people in the UK pay their tax on the time, and their neighbor gets one saying nine out of 10 people in Oxford, what, what if they show each other and they realize that that line's different? Which I think massively over, <laughs> overestimates how how long people spend uh, engaging with government letters, and and of course no one no one checks. Um, and we very deliberately used a framing around test and adapt rather than experimentation early on to to build that acceptance. And I think now that that critique is is much less. There's thousands of projects across the world, including in India, showing what this looks like in reality, and it, it isn't scary. Uh, most of the time, it, you, know, you can see the value. The other argument we make is, of course, that government is inherently in the business of behavior change, right? There, there is no neutral way to write a letter, to design a health insurance scheme, to design a breastfeeding scheme. So you might as well do it in a way which is built on solid evidence and a nuanced understanding uh, of human behavior. But it is also right that you know trust is hard won, easy lost. So it's better to be transparent, you know, to talk and explain the work that you're doing and why. And we've seen that, that that doesn't dissipate the impact of this. So one of the interventions we didn't talk about was the introduction of a sugar levy on, on cans, you know, on, on sugar sweetened beverages. And we explicitly set out, we hope this drives reformulation of products by companies. That wasn't a secret. It was that this is why we've designed the tax in this way. And in fact, it you know, maybe even worked better than we hoped. So we were very transparent uh, about that. But if you are using things like defaults, you, know, you, you better be clear with the public why you are setting them in that way. Because we've seen that in the private sector and some of the stuff in the gambling sector, which is very, very worrying. So you, know, you should set out why, why you do that. And in some areas, you will want the permission of the public, right? So if, if you go back to that sugar and sweeten uh, uh, beverage levy, you know, we explicitly engaged the population about that and showed them. And actually, when we called it you know, a tax, one of the lessons is if you say, do you think we should bring in a sugar tax? Everyone says, no, right? And so reframe as a levy. But also when we showed them the evidence over a couple of days, actually, they, they went from, no, you shouldn't do that, to, well, of, of course you should do that. I'd never really understood how much the environment shaped our behavior. And again, I remember very powerfully at the end of this two days that a woman who was you know, quite visibly overweight stood up quite emotionally and said, I'd never understood how the environment and the system shaped my behavior. And actually, this has really helped me to understand you know, myself 
and we want the government to take action. We want you to introduce this tax and, and hypothecate actually to other health programs. So, you know, one of the really interesting things in, in India is that generally the population is quite pro intervention. They're quite pro government regulation compared to particularly the US, right? So there's this huge potential to work with the public and to build that support and work out actually how do you use that to make the population more healthy to save the planet. And, and again, that's why we're so excited to be here. You know, if, 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 if we can help that, that fight in, in India to, to help be more sustainable, to help health systems, then hopefully we'll all have done uh, you know, a good job together. Thanks, that's, that's very optimistic and, and, and very positive. Um, so I'll, I'll come uh, to you Radharani on this, just probing this point a little further. Um, that when you actually do this on the ground, design, when one designs behavior change solutions, um, what kind of ethical blind spots should one be, be uh, mindful of uh, while doing so? I think ethics, for me, is equal to empathy, actually. Um, and I, I think one must avoid the Marie Antoinette syndrome. Uh, of you know offering cake when bread is wanted. So if you're designing solutions, then it's better to be designing um, with a sense of ambition, with a sense of scale, of designing ambitions that are accessible to the to the audiences. Uh, therefore, at the time when we were looking at designing solutions, digital solutions, mobile solutions for frontline health workers and communities in Bihar, we could have done something that was very fancy, an app. But we realized from our media and mobile landscaping study that the only thing that was largely predominantly being used both by practitioners like frontline health workers and families was really the voice call. And therefore, we went back to IVR, which is, you know, possibly the oldest sort of, you know, uh, voice app. So our killer app was the voice call. Uh, the second thing, the other, the, the other side of that empathy coin is also looking at motivation versus ability. So sometimes it's better to be looking at what the, the audiences are able to do, which is why, you know, you'd hear... Uh, the term simple doable actions or um, looking at stuff that they can do without them being manipulated. And the second thing after empathy is actually giving people choices. So when you're looking at designing solutions, whether you're working on fecal sludge management and learning from work you've done, you know, to say that, okay, fine, if you're asking people to uh, think about septic tanks when they're building their house homes, then how do you do it with a sense of not being prescriptive, but including it in the must-haves or must-dos when you're building a home, and not really expecting people who have already built homes without a, a septic tank or with a very large septic tank to calendarize the cleaning of the tank. So really deep empathy and you know, ability and choices. I think that would define ethics for the way we approach design solutions. Thanks, thanks for that. Um, so the final discussion that I want us to have is um, on what's next for in the field of behavior science and behavior change. And we, um, in nowadays, uh, there is no conversation that uh, can be done without the mention of ChatGPT. Um, so my uh, question, I'll, I'll start with you, Neerat, on this. In your view, um, what's next in the field of behavior science and behavior change, particularly in the context of new innovations such as ChatGPT and generative AI? So I, I think just uh, I'll lay out the way I think of, about this problem and uh, also look back to look forward. Okay? So, uh, so what is AI? I, I think going back to I think the entropy thing, AI is really a very efficient reduction of entropy, right? So what it is able to do is able to d detect patterns from a lot of noise and then build certain artifacts from that pattern, right? Uh, now, if you look at, if you were to almost create like a seven ladders of AI maturity in a society, right? Uh, go. So what you need is you need some signal, you need some data, and you need the means to detect that some patterns from the data, right? So, so let's say uh, rewind the clock 10,000 years, there was hardly any data in the society. There was hardly any codified data in, the, in society. So you had some painting, uh, then you, let's say, had uh, some language, then you had books, uh, but it was very difficult to analyze it. 
Now you have, uh, you got computers, you got radio, you got uh, inter connected computers, internet. Uh, now you have lots and lots of things which generate data. You have a data exhaust that's coming from credit card transactions from the way we see media. Uh, just about a couple of weeks ago, we got that f news where brain signals uh, are being detected and you can make out what that person is thinking based on their brain signal, right? So, so the data is evolving very quickly. And with that, because it's correlated, the ability to make sense and also to generate stuff from the data is evolving. Now, so that's how AI is. It, it's basically, it detects patterns and it creates new things based on those patterns, right? Uh, that's generative AI. And it, it does that now across different mediums. So it can do numbers, it can do words, it can do pictures, it can do video, right? Uh, now, what is this behavioral change ecosystem? So I, I say there, I mean, for the sake of simplicity, uh, for the sake of this discussion, let's create a very simple model of the behavioral change ecosystem. Let's call it the citizen as one node in that ecosystem. A classic three-body kind of a system, right? So you have the uh, citizen, you have the uh, people on the supply side. So you've got uh, private sector actors, you've got philanthropies, you've got government. That's the second node. And you've got people like us. That's the behavioral community, right? That's sort of trying to do something here, something there. Now, I, I think what's, again, I'm going to use the East framework. Now, it's making certain things easy for all of these actors. AI will make, so just recently, I think, Jugal Bandi, which is uh, Gramvani's innovation, uh, Aditya, and uh, even Satya Nadella talk about, uh, it's a local language kind of uh, query engine. So AI will make it very easy for citizens to discover information on their own, and their baseline behaviors will change. So things that are appearing to us right now in this room as behavioral problems will cease to be behavioral problems. That's the first hypothesis, okay? it might lead to more behavioral problems because citizens enact certain behaviors that they're not enacting. So, so that's what's happening in node one. What's gonna happen in node two is it'll become very easy to create, uh, the second node is the node of uh, public sector, philanthropy and private sector. I, I think certain things become very easy for them to do, right? They're able to sort of generate things that they know will appeal. So the cost of, let's say, customized video production will go uh, to almost near zero, right? You can actually create through prompts, you can create films which will be optimized to nudge and, and this and that. So, so I would say very soon, unless regulated, you will see almost universal, uh, like hyper-customized messaging, right? That's gonna happen. But I, I think there's a huge uh, role that this third node can play, and that's that sort of, uh, come, uh, which is the behavioral kind of experts. I think we need to equip the other actors with certain tools which make it easy for them to, the, to do the right thing, right? And, and by the right thing, I, I mean the behaviorally sensitive thing, the smart thing, uh, maybe even the ethical thing, right? Um, so, so Dahlberg along with CSBC uh, and uh, Archana and Gates and others, we are developing this thing called the Atlas of Behavior Change and Development. Our hypothesis is very straightforward that right now it's very difficult for multiple nodes on, in the supply side to do, to identify what the behavioral problem is to then create an intervention and then to deploy that intervention at scale. So what you need is like a, a ERP for behavior change, right? And you need an AI-enabled ERP. So that's what we are building. And just recently, we have, we're gonna release it very quickly. Uh, we've built the first AI-based module there. Uh, and we're building custom kind of uh, features, custom corpuses, all of that. Uh, I, I think really exciting, but we have to, tread very cautiously, uh, have guardrails in place, because the ethical question is very, very uh, uh, important. And ethics, both of omission and of commission, right? Mm -hmm. So you might, if you don't do the right things, you might exclude certain perspectives that are very, very important. Uh, and obviously, this, I, I, think, I think of the, the, the act of commission very differently in ethics, behavioral nudges, the question you just asked. I think fundamentally, it's at two different levels, right? The first level is, what should the scope of government even be? What business is government in? So that's the what question. The second is the how question. How should the government go about the objectives it has claimed for itself, right? I think that's what most of the, uh, this nudge ethics kind of uh, question focuses on. But actually the more important question is the first question. What business does government have in determining, let's say, MSP for whatever crop, right? I'm not saying I, I don't think it has a business. I, I do think it has some business. Uh, or determining the size of a, a low income dwelling, right? Or whatever it is, or, or giving free buses to uh, whoever, so yeah. Thanks, thanks, uh, Neerad, for that. Um, Shujai, do you want to make uh, in, uh, any final comment on the same question, perhaps more from a researcher perspective? Well, uh, on, on, on usage of AIML, 
Well, I have my, the, I was introduced to chat GPT by my student, XPG, who's, who's right here, who teaches in a DU college, and he's the one who came with me with his paper, and he's like, I'm like, wow, it looks really like well organized. And he said one thing, he said chat GPT. <laughs> so I think uh, to be more seriously, I feel that these tools like AI ML uh, type tools, I think would help in certain classes of problems where I think there would be less of these ethical issues. Like, uh, you know, where you need very fair evaluation, multidimensional. I feel interview mechanisms, for example, with humans is highly, highly biased. And we are influenced by all kinds of weird things. Oh, wow, his tie is really good. I mean, the fact that he doesn't know anything. But, you know, you get, humans get influenced by all kinds of visual uh, you know, cues. So I think they're using more, uh, you know, tools which actually evaluate individuals may be a little better for specific functions. That being said, I don't think in in situations where context and subjectivity is important, things like uh, creativity, things like divergent thinking. I think that's where AI has a ways to go, and I feel that. We should not be applying the wrong thing to, you know, to the wrong context. And I think that's the main issue where a lot of stuff happens and wrong stuff happens. But I feel if we are a little careful about applying it to contexts in which it works well, which I feel is multidimensional evaluation often, which we really fail as humans because we are too... To have too many biases, you know, all kinds of hindsight, confirmation, blah, 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 you know. There, I feel an ML algorithm would actually do quite well. I mean, aided by humans. I'm not saying some, you know, sci-fi like Netflix show where, you know, the, the, the AI goes mad and takes over and stuff like that. We're quite far from that, I believe. So that's No what age I of think. Ultron. Yeah, not, I mean, I think that's a ways to go. I think that's, you know. That, Thank that's you. that's that's interesting. Yeah, thanks. thanks very much. Actually, thanks for having me here. Th Shabata. Thanks, mm -hmm. Shujai. So I think we have been able to cover a range of different topics on 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 behavior science um, so far, um, from the ethics of it to how culture plays a role to where it's going next. And uh, I want to now open up um, uh, to the audience because we have a absolutely fantastic uh, group of audience here, and um, to the fact that we actually had to. Um, say sorry to over 100 people because seats were limited. Um, and so everyone you know, who is here are very self-selected, interested people in behavior science. And I'm sure they have lots of questions for our panelists. Um, so we are going to open up uh, for some audience questions. Uh, but I just have two humble requests uh, from all of you before that. One is uh, just limit to one question because we want to take uh, as many questions as possible. And secondly, if you have um, do ask a question. If you have any comment uh, um, or observation that you want to share with all of us, all our panelists are going to be around for dinner. So, so we'll be available. Please come and talk to us then. Um, so do ask a question. Uh, if you have a question, raise your hand. I'll, I'll ask one of, our, uh, one of our people to come. Uh, uh, maybe a uh, gentleman with blue shirt in front Shek. of the mic. Yes, Shojo. Hi. Thank you, Shagad. Uh, this is a quick, simple question. So from an ethical standpoint of view, do the panelists believe that the people being nudged have a right to know about the nature of the nudge and its ultimate goal? And paradoxically, if you, I know I'm being nudged, does it reduce the efficacy of it? Who, who wants to take that? Should I want to take yeah. So I think that's a great question. And I also feel that we are somewhat, at least in the first generation of research on nudges, people were not concerned about that. And, you know, we are like libertarian paternalism. So, you know, we are always giving them a choice. But I think particularly in Global South context, sometimes if you use certain types of nudges uh, and you say, oh, but, you know, there's no problem, there's no financial issues, I think things like shame, things like, uh, ob you know, people don't live in individual, I feel people in the West live much more individual lives, you know, and they're easier to nudge. Here, I feel sometimes nudges, even though they technically have no financial you know, cost or anything, would actually have costs in terms of reputation, etc. So I feel that particularly in a global south context, we have to be a little more careful with nudging. It's not enough to just say, hey, there's no direct financial, you know, implications for it. Then that means there are no costs. 
That is incorrect, I believe. And so that's the one thing. But that being said, when people know they are being nudged, often things go a little awry. So, I mean, this is what, uh, if you read the work of Hertwig and these guys, Ralph Hertwig and people at the Max Planck, they actually talk about doing boosts rather than nudges, which are longer range things, you know, where you explain to people, hey, we're teaching you this for a reason, you know, instead of trying to change defaults, etc. So there could be a case for boosts as well as nudges, I believe. Thank you. Does anyone want to add to that? Okay, all right. Um, yes, the lady at the back. Hi, hello. So good to see you, Professor, and uh, Doc Professor Pavan as well. I'm a student of Ashoka University, and I'm also the director of my organization, Voice. And uh, we work with arts for social change, and especially for public health. Uh, my question is um, for Radha Rani and for Rory. Um, I recently attended a consultation uh, with the Indian buskers. Um, you know, it was how we can have um, arts on the streets of India. And um, there were a lot of interesting discussions. And I lived in Australia too for a couple of years. And uh, one of the things that I thought was very interesting there was you know, how people had the freedom to do things on the street and earn with dignity. And uh, in India, sadly, um, you know, like puppetry, for example, is recognized as an art form, but it's not the puppeteer is not recognized. Um, there's a lot of policies and, you know, other things happening. So since all of you have so much experience in this field and, um, you know, I want to just pick your <laughs> ideas, you know, if there's something like that which has happened, um, you know, to make the streets of Delhi and India more lively, and uh, if this was a problem for us to solve, uh, just your quick thoughts on that. <laughs> Thank you. Streets of Delhi are a very difficult proposition, but I don't think I have a complete answer to your question, but just in terms of change, uh, if you look around in Delhi, one of the visible changes that has happened is the murals on the walls in certain areas. So it's really about designing space and in terms of performances and having cultural activities like busking or street theater or puppetry. Uh, I think uh, the, the solution, not the solution, but one of the ways in which that can be started or that can be that can be made better is to create safe spaces, and therefore, you know, there are many different civic and uh, other concerns, governance concerns like safety, like urban spaces, design of those spaces, and then of course enabling people to, you know, uh, basically assemble and do that. One of the, one, I think one of the reasons why these things don't take off in this city is because of extreme weather conditions, if you ask me. And that's really a factor, and no behavior science can really change it, unless we have, uh, you know, we have money to build um, uh, transparent bubbles, creating hypnosis. Uh, hypnosis, yeah, but then that would get into uh, very dubious dicey kind of territory. dicey territory, yeah. One, one good example of, of that uh, is uh, the Lodi Art District. If any of you have gone there, that's actually a fantastic uh, example of that. Um, I think uh, Nilanjan at the back has a hand raised for a while now. Maybe we can go to her. Thank you. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank you all for taking the time and sharing your rich insights from your illustrious career. Um, what I sort of summed up from the panel discussion today is that context matters. But I actually want to focus on the other end of the spectrum. And so my question is for um, Urvashi, ma'am. Um, when you're conducting a project geared towards behavior change, how do you balance focused or nuanced insights from the field, which is basically context, with the scalability or generalizability required for policy design, and which is also something that the government always looks towards? How do we scale programs? Thank you. Um, thanks for that question. I mean, I think. Um, to answer that, maybe I'll just use a couple of examples, right? So I think both the sort of user insights or field insights sort of serve one purpose, uh, but that's 
sort of complements kind of uh, questions around scalability and generalizability. So uh, just to give you an example, one of the studies we've done in the past um, looked at sort of the adoption of improved uh, cook stoves uh, in uh, Odisha. And uh, I won't go into the details of it, but you know, it's one of many evaluations on the subject that's been done now. And, and what they've increasingly found is, you know, these cook stoves which are designed to reduce indoor air pollution, um, uh, you know, houses set them up, they use them for a few months, but in the longer run, you know, the primary cook, uh, there was no uh, sort of significant change on their health, um, and there was also no significant change on, their, on the indoor, indoor air pollution in the house. And what we learned from that study was, A, that, you know, this technology, maybe it's like sort of not the silver bullet that people thought, but some of the insights that came out of, uh, looking at why it was not working were really interesting. So, um, for example, this is a stove which is set up in the house. It's connected to a chimney. Uh, you have like two openings, uh, and these openings are fairly small. And so, the usually women, but the person who's cooking, it would take a lot longer to cook than the traditional cook stove. So they kind of just went back to using that stove at the same time, right? The cost of trying to use it, maintaining, cleaning the chimney after a point was too much of a hassle. Uh, and so it was easier for people, people to continue using the traditional stove uh, simultaneously. And so I think from uh, something like three meals a week, which was still a fairly low figure in the first year, it dropped down to an average of about one and a half meals a week uh, when this study was done. So that's an interesting insight and it's powerful. It can help you also think about how to improve that technology. But when we're thinking about scalability, uh, I think it matters to know sort of on average, you know, like what's the impact of a program. But it also matters to think about, uh, especially when you're adapting for scale, uh, how, where, what's the sort of replicability of the local conditions, right? Like, um, are you adapting to a similar context? Has the context changed? So just to use another example, there's been work that we've done around incentives to improve immunization. The original study we did, and this is a prog program that we're trying to scale up now, uh, there we provided lentils to uh, improve full immunization coverage. This happened like in the early 2000s in Rajasthan. By the time we were scaling up this program, we were trying to fi figure out like what's the equivalent, what should be the incentive, uh, and this was in Haryana. And we struggled to find the right dal because oh, or lentils, right? Different parts of Haryana, they consume different lentils. This was a larger evaluation. And so what we settled on finally was mobile top-ups. Uh, because by that time, you know, phone usage had increased so much that this could be an effective um, uh, incentive. And I think the, the key takeaway is that when you're thinking about scalability, it's, it's not so much just like that specific intervention, but really like the broader lesson and how do you adapt now as you're trying to scale up, right? Um. All right, thank you. Uh, yes, you, madam? Hello. Yeah. My question is addressed to Urvashi. Uh, you know, when you're dealing with powerful people like chief secretaries and others, uh, there's a lot of social consensus based understanding, right? Like they are powerful people, they are excellent decision makers, they are very intelligent, and they are there because they have those capabilities, right? Uh, how do you convince them? that it's necessary to actually focus on empiricism and evaluation. Because all the incentive for them is to actually validate and justify the social consensus. It's, it's a problem in corporate India as well. So I, in, any learning that you can give from your experience would be very helpful. No, I think that's a very good question, and I, I can't say that everybody is convinced. And I think like part of our challenge has been that social consensus will always be you know a part of the decision-making framework for anybody, right? And and people will rely on their instincts. They'll re rely on you know, I spent like one year doing this. This is what I learned. I know this problem in and out, and so that will work, right? That you are kind of when you're trying to do things. It's, uh, while trying to sort of evaluate, experiment, you are always kind of trying to push them in the direction of looking at something else. So I think 
I can't sort of answer the question of whether, you know, what can change with these people, but I think what helps is to identify the right kind of people, right? And you actually have to get them to also understand evidence uh, and why it's important. So I think it's not just enough to say, assume that, you know, just because it, the evidence exists, that they will use it. Uh, so I think there's, we try to do a lot of work on also sort of building capacity around using evaluation evidence because it, it helps for them to have a different framework to think about these things as well, right? I think the, the mistake we make is sometimes to think that they they have bad intentions because they're relying on social consensus. I don't think, most of them are actually trying to do good. Um, they have the right intentions, but we need to kind of place a different kind of solution or way of thinking in front of them uh, sometimes. Do you want to add to that? Just, just to add quickly, one technique we've used, um, particularly I think I totally agree with the point, find your champions. But it's not to say, this is a great idea, Minister. Why don't we do an evaluation and tell you if it works or not? We say, it's such a fantastic idea. Why don't we try five different versions? And we'll find out which works best. And then we can take it to scale. And we're not going to wait two years. We'll give you these results in the next three months. So I do think the framing around it's not just pass fail, but it's which works best and for who is, is key. I just want to pick up very quickly on the earlier point. Of course, we want transparency around nudges, right, at a societal level. But I think we have to be realistic, right? You don't want, if you walk into a supermarket, to you know sign before you go in, this has been designed using behavioral science, so I'm happy to go around, right? It's, it's unrealistic, I think, to think that every time an individual interacts with a state or a private, we're going we're gonna to give informed consent or we're going to get let them know, right? But the point is to be transparent at a societal level. So if they want to trace it back, that they can do that. So I think, again, we just got to be realistic about the priorities of government and the ability to deliver these types of trials at pace. Does any of you want to uh, make a final comment on this? I wanted to add uh, a comment to uh, Urvashi's in response to what you asked, Hamsini. I think that we've had enormous experience with government and working at various levels because uh, most of our work has got leveraged by government and not do, uh, you know scaling it up has been done with government funding and i think that from experience what i've seen is that government wants to get to scale from the word go right and the one thing to sort of manage that circumstance so that you don't make colossal errors and waste public money or public goods is to say that fine we can't wait to go to scale and you know we can't wait for an evaluation to be done but i think in nine cases out of ten we've been able to convince the decision maker whether it's the chief secretary or the additional secretary or the secretary of a ministry to say that look we need to test prototypes we need to prototype and we need to test and therefore give us that time to make mistakes, learn from the mistakes before we go to scale, and then do that rapidly. And, you know, sell them the idea. I think sell is a very, um, it's, a, it's a word that's often looked down upon, but I think you have to sell that point of view and that model and convince them that it's better to do this user testing and then we can rapidly go to scale because they're not going to wait and they're not going to look at doing five different things in the Indian context, at least in my experience. So user testing is very important, you know, testing while developing the idea to go to scale. Thank you. Neera, do you want to make a final yeah. comment on that? This one thing, I think, choose the right people. So be an aspirin, not a vitamin, right? So if people are facing a big problem, then they listen to you. That's when their confidence is not very high. People don't listen to you when they are very confident about their approach. So, so just choose the right bureaucrat to work with who's struggling with the problem that's not working <laughs> well for them, right? <laughs> Right. So, on that note, I think uh, I think we all kind of try to navigate through the same situations and, and have these shared experiences. Uh, and unlike behavior science, uh, uh, this is not really a science. So, how to navigate at the intersection of uh, science and policy making is more of an art. Um, and uh, and we all are sort of learning as we are as we are doing. And hopefully, there's a lot of uh, these kind of collaborations with help to sort of share knowledge and, and our learnings from each other. Um, so we were out of time about 10 minutes ago, and my uh, team is nudging me constantly. Uh, I can see that. Um, and I don't want to be the person standing between uh, you and dinner. Uh, but I know there are a lot of questions which are still not answered. So um, all of our panelists are going to be around. So please feel free to um, come up during dinner, uh, which is going to serve, be served just right outside. 
um, and, and ask the questions that did not get answered uh, during the panel discussion. Uh, but I would uh, like to thank all of you for uh, the great discussion, all of your insights, and uh, to the audience uh, for being such a fantastic audience and uh, listening to us patiently and, and coming uh, and, and joining uh, us today on this. And please uh, be around for, uh, for dinner. Um, and uh, we are going to, I'll invite Pavan to make some closing remarks. But before that, um, I think we have some small gifts for our, um, for our panelists. So we'll give that. You and your dinner. Um, I'm, I'm truly grateful uh, to our Vice Chancellor, uh, to David, Rory, and uh, our distinguished panelists. I think it was a scintillating conversation. Thank you very much. Uh, I learned a lot from this conversation. Um, the, the question about uh, how do you deal with bureaucrats is a, we should chat more about it. Uh, I have coined an expression for it. It's called professional empiricism, which often, which often falls short of scientific empiricism. Professional empiricism depends on the number of years that you have worked and uh, the self-selected type of people whom you have met, leading to systematic biases in the way that you draw inferences about society. Uh, and the kind of people that you often meet are also people with conflicts of interest because you're in a position of power and that completely distorts your epistemology. So I mean, we can talk at great length <laughs> about that um, and how to present evidence to the bureaucracy that goes back to the Galileo question that we talked about. How could he have presented it to the Medici family in a manner that was non-adversarial and make the Medici family feel that they actually were the discoverers of the truth and not Galileo himself? <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a trick that can work with bureaucrats. And, uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, very, uh, very happy about, about this. We'll have a recording of this as well that will be made available. And uh, very grateful. I'm really, really enthusiastic about partnering with BIT, of course, our partner, uh, Bias. And we want to do some exciting stuff. I'm deeply intrigued by David's work on market mechanism. We've got to talk more about that. We've got to do the competition commission thing. We've got to do consumer protection. AI, ML, all the good stuff. Thank you very much.